Okay, so boom. You finally realize the power of emails and owning your own data. So you create a newsletter and get a landing page fired up. You send out your first email and bloop, it's in the promotions folder. Unless you're an e-commerce company, I'm sorry to tell you, but the promotion folder is not going to help you. This is why you should get ConvertKit. ConvertKit specializes in keeping your email in the primary folder so you can increase your open rates and communicate with your audience. They also have beautifully designed landing pages and squeeze pages for you to capture more emails. I personally love the fact that they have good support. Support for me is everything. If I have a problem, I need to know I can get someone on the line or have a video that answers all of my questions. Hustlers don't give up. They say, yo, let me figure this out. I figured it out with ConvertKit. And that's not the show. Yes, yes, indeed. Hello. Am I sounding good? Welcome. Yes, bro. We're sounding fantastic. How you mean? <clears throat> you ready to pod? Right. I'm ready to pod, bro. Let's go. Let's go. Let's get it. Let's get it. Okay. And okay. Welcome. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Jake just dropped, man. The energy hits different now. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Hello and welcome to the Hustle Over Everything podcast. This is the podcast where we receive stories, tips, and strategies from entrepreneurs who've done it to help you grow your business and take yourself to the next level as a person. On the podcast today, we have Jabril Ogoro. He's a co-founder of Literature Academy with the Bajanista. It's a little name you might not have heard of her, you know. He created the travel platform Passport Heavy that has over 200,000 subscribers on YouTube and is now on Noir TV. He also has a, a marketing academy called Add Value, uh, Empire to say the least. You know, um, I'm excited to talk about this. If you don't already remember, in uh, our first interview together, we talked about, you know, who influences us. And mm-hmm. one of the person I actually mentioned was Jabril Agoro. You know, so that's one option. Another one is trust at scale, mm-hmm. where um, you are delivering value to gain trust at scale. Mm-hmm. A prime example of that is Gary V, um, with what he's doing. Another example of that is a uh, passport heavy or Jabril and yeah, his, passport and heavy. Like uh, yeah, that's a crazy ass. That's a crazy. I, I watch his videos. Like once you told me about him, like I've been addicted to watching yeah, like, yeah. all his videos. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to Jabril. Um, that guy's like a big brother too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You talk, you talk very highly of him a lot. I mean, because you know what it is, man. Rep- representation is key. You know, um, he's like a black man doing like travel. Yeah, lodge, right? and there's yeah. not a lot of people who do. And now we have him on the podcast one year later. Yeah, it's crazy what Brand can happen. Legs. It's crazy what can happen in ten months, bro. I think, I think um, this is the eleventh month, and then April will actually be April seventh will be our actual podversary if i if and i'm going by the launch of the first episode we read together with that uh, chris from okay. um uh, toronto toronto blogger toronto blogger, toronto blogger. exactly right yeah toronto so Bloggers Club. shout out to chris man. shout out to chris bro like first ever guest killed it first week of the pandemic and um right we got it popping bro and now we're here full circle the when we did the first um host host you know kind of introduction to hustle over everything we spoke about jabril you're like man he got me into facebook marketing digital marketing and when full circle you know when we're still in this panini we got we're launching we're coming back around this time you spoke about and jabril agoro is on the show that is that is beautiful bro absolutely beautiful man i'm, I'm excited to, to jump in and we got some things we're gonna talk about real quick man jay-z just Dropped a big bomb on us. What do you think about the deal Bro, this... with title and Twitter Square Cash App? Let's talk about it. Jay Z is he does everything, bro. I, f- I feel like there's nothing this guy can't do. Think about his historic career. This guy's killed it in fashion. He's now killed it in 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 uh, in liquor. Now he's to LVMH. Now he's partnering with Jack Dorsey, selling like his shares in Title. He's done. He's owned an NBA team. He's like top, like one of the greatest rappers ever to have a grace the mic. 
you know i mean he's got the baddest girl in the world like this guy is just the rocking his chain exactly he's the epitome of winning so when jay-z does these things i'm just kind of like what else can he not do like next thing for me bro is like him being president or something like that but i think this is a very president pres- like I, I would not put it past him to be Crazy. president bro jay-z has like the presidential uh swag to him which you know if he were to run like maybe in his 50s 60s I think people will really give him a shot at it, but I'm very happy that he sold it. I think everything he's doing is very strategic. If you really look like at the moves he's making, selling half of it to LVMH, he knows like I have the brand, but they have distribution, logistics, and supply chain that I can't really tap into. Jack Dorsey, he's tapped into Twitter. Twitter's an evolving platform. He's evolved in Square. So if you look at his ventures, Jack is like a very innovative guy in the way he does things in taking them to the next level you see what square is doing now square cash has like permeated through hip-hop you look at square they're now becoming a bank where they're giving entrepreneurs micro loans twitter's offering like this paywall for users so he can take the music thing and really allow it to have like a strong position in the market with title and apple music and you need that type of person around you to be able to like get to the next level so big ups to jay man i'd love to get your thoughts on it because you know i call you the oracle bro you are the oracle. You call this second time, second time, bro. Two second for two. Time. So, what? Get tell us what you saw early on that made you make that call, and now that it's happened, how do you feel? And just share your thought process that led you to like have that belief initially. Man, as soon as I saw Beyonce put her um, catalog on Spotify, I was like, "That's that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Interesting move that that just happened there." Then I saw Jay Z put his hit his catalog on Spotify, and I'm like, "Oh no, nah, this is calculated." Mm. And then I see Spotify, "Welcome Jay Z, thank you for coming joining our platform." I'm like, "Huh, thank you, eh?" Thank mm. you. Mm. <laughs> Watch, well, wow, thank you. I know Jay Z was looking at like, like, "Huh, y'all want to give me thanks, eh?" Yeah. Y'all. Watch. <laughs> I had a feeling, man. That's why I called on the pod to say, you know, Jay Z's about to sell title, and I was right. Bro. You know, but what's good is that he, got, he has a board seat. It's good that, you know, everyone that was a stakeholder before, all the artists that have stakeholders will now participate in, um, you know, the, the winnings and um, everything that comes with mm-hmm. this movement. So uh, I'm excited to see that. And it's a great move. It's, it's good to see someone um, sell the company and get a board seat and not just sell the company and, and, and just move dash. off somewhere, you know? Exactly. So it's, just, it's a testament to what he has um, coming up. Like you're saying, like there's gonna be a merging between, you know, the music industry and the financial industry, mm-hmm. and that move can be huge. You know, like imagine if you know, um, Jay drops an album on Title slash Square slash Twitter where you can purchase the whole thing through Cash App, and you know, that's the wave, bro. Like people are that's strategic, the wave. man. Or Bitcoin, exactly. Strategic so, moves. I, exactly. So I, I think it's it's a big, 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 big move. You know, um, all the big news that's happening, Dr. Seuss is in the, is in the news. I, have you heard about this? No, enlighten me, bro. So Dr. Seuss has recently come forward and mentioned that they're getting rid of some of their books because uh, they have some kind of, uh, you know, back racist content that uh, happens in their books. So in some kind of micro racial like tendency that mm. that. You know, they flagged and said that, hey, we're going to get rid of some of our books to make sure that we're historically correct and, you know, serving our audience best. Wow. I heard that and I was like, hmm, a company acknowledging this. I really thought about that and I was like, nah, this is a marketing scheme. It's a marketing scheme, eh? Low key. I think it's a marketing scheme because if they wanted to, they could have just got rid of them and not said anything. Mm-hmm. But, like, the fact that I have to make it public, public and... and uh outspoken about it it tells you that there's something more to it and you know what um sidebar onto this you know a lot of companies play the racial side of things i remember h&m right they had like the 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 black child like with monkeying around and it's like this like black kid around it if you're in that room and you're in the marketing board and you're looking like this is not something that slips your mind right these marketing teams go through one two whatever 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 and they're smart people. These are not like dumb, like, you know, there's racial undertones behind that. 
So I think companies use black outreach to really get their share of, uh, share of mind up, um, get like people talking about the brand, talking about whatever, and like just get H&M in their heads. You know what I'm saying? And the thing about it is like people forget, but they always remember the brand. Right. So like, oh, yeah, like H&M, da, 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 da. Like, but they forget about the clothing or whatever they did and they just keep it going. Right. So it's like a way just to get like your impressions up, get people talking about you and you just get start a conversation and just maybe it's like to drown out the competitors to to get people forgetting about the competitor. If they've launched a campaign, like let's hit them with some shock value and get them like talking about us and screw Banana Republic or Club Monaco or whatever. I don't know. That's just like maybe yeah. some thoughts I'm having. So let me tell you something, right? Now that you're, let's see, say you have a kid right now, right? Mm-hmm. Where, where are you gonna buy the books from? Are you gonna buy a book from doc, like drseuss.com? Are you gonna go, gonna go to Amazon and be like, hmm, what book makes sense for my kid? Like the marketing channel that Seuss used to have, is kind of, is shifting now. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. the kids like I think, like a lot of parents now can like go buy the kids book from that black group on Facebook that you know niche company on etsy Mm -hmm. you know there's so many different lanes to buy books from so the competition's a lot thicker yeah you know before it used to be scholastic only or the library only so this the market was you know a lot more in like in one lane so now there's more competition they have to get creative with ways they can market and i thought that was genius because you know like let's 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 play this out like what what bad could have came of that nothing nothing at all Nothing really could cook that could come bad from that. So that's when I'm like, oh, this is a marketing scheme. And it works. Because right now, Dr. Seuss is topping Amazon charts after six, after the six titles have been pulled. I'm reading an article from CTV News right now mm. written by Brooke Taylor. Mm-hmm. You know, Amazon, I mean, um, yeah, like I said, the books have are on top of Amazon charts. Mm-hmm. So, you know. Who knows? That's just that, though. What do you think? I mean... Again, to like what I said, like I think like right now it's um, there's a lot more people, even moms and dads writing books because they have distribution, as you said. So it's now like mm-hmm. a freer market. I think it's like now we're opening like the children's market, the children education market for children, because a lot more people are creating board games or creating like different games and books that all are bundled together to like really help your child with math and reading and whatever. So it's not going to be more about Dr. Seuss. It's all about like who can use like their resources the best, who can tap into their own community the best and like really exploit that and get their kids learning the way they want to learn. Right. It's not just Dr. Seuss as if like they're the, the the only brand or whatever. But I mean, that's some good insight, bro. I mean, I can't really say much more about it because I'm just learning about it right now. But from what I've historically learned about, it's like just the shock value that race brings into marketing is unprecedented most definitely most definitely so speaking of that man uh one thing that has been um, very evident is uh facebook and how they're creating profiles on people you know Mm. they can create a profile on you you know that can, can determine your race without you even being on facebook did you know this they can determine my race without determine like without so I've never signed up for an account. Never signed up for an account. But how do they how do they target me if I've never signed up for an account? Alright, so take this in. Facebook business work like a sign up and give you your you give you your give your information away. They work like GPS as well. Mm-hmm. You know how GPS works, right? Absolutely. They triangulate your position by everybody being on the highway. Mm-hmm. You get me? So because it's a, it's a big cluster, they're, oh, the highway is jammed because all the little points of everybody being on it, right? Yeah. But Facebook works the same way. So even though I, Alex, have not created a profile, let's say my mom created a profile, you created a profile, my girl created a profile, and they're able to triangulate who I am based off of everybody around me. So there's a whole profile for Alex that's not in existence until... I log in and be like, oh no, you have information, take it down. Mm. It's called shadow profiles. So Facebook does that. So once you log in, you're like, oh, they have my, my contact information from this person, from that person, they're their pictures of me. 
And that's because they create shadow profiles of people. So they already have your information before you even log on to the platform now. That's so messed. That is that that is actually <laughs> scary as hell. That's crazy, that's, right? Bro, you know yeah. the thing is like let's say I meet someone at uh I remember one time I went to Cabana and then you know there's yeah. like a group of people with a with the bottles and everything, right? You know, you just dap up, man. You're like rah rah rah. You're like ching ling ling. You know, like like glasses like clicking and everything. Boom. We chuck deuces. We go home. Four or five days later, I'm like scrolling and like you may know this person, right? And I'm like rah. Like it's that character I met at Cabana the other day, and we have no mutuals. We have nothing. No one at all. We did not exchange numbers. I did not get his IG. It was just strictly the closest thing contact we had. It's just like a, a handshake, like a bro, like a bro handshake. And like we left it, we kept it moving. And then another time I see another person who was there, but we didn't even have an interaction. That was a crazy part. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just like, man, how do you, how can you know I might know this person? Is it, is it like, and that's why I'm learning. Is it like uh, Facebook can ping other profiles like that are near each other? For sure. You know what I'm saying? Without a doubt. Without a doubt, there's that, and it's even more complicated than that. You know, the, your phone is spying on you, and not even what you think. Like, your smart TV and um, your phone talk to each other without you knowing. Like, there's sounds that you know um, are unable to be detected by your ears that is emitted through the TV and through your phone, so they talk to each other without you knowing, so they can triangulate your position, mm. you know, to know where you are. But that's neither here nor there, man. Let's go to the business tip of the week. Anything else to talk about before you head on? Yo, Drizzy. I mean, I know he just dropped a track. Oh, yeah. yeah you know, yeah, putting yeah. Toronto. Like, that's the most Toronto music video, like, Drake's ever made. Like, that's the epitome of the 666, he... bro. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm trying to think where else he hasn't shot. Like, I think he needs to shoot in, um, in Scarborough Town Center. I think he so, did, right? He well, shoot. that was Yorkdale. Nah. That was Yorkdale. That was Yorkdale he did. He hasn't done Scarborough Town Center or Mall of Mall. There needs to be some Scarborough rapping. You know what I'm saying? He's done this for everywhere else. Bro. Besides them too. Like my friend Yahia said um, for for that song, he's just like, yo, this is the Gardner anthem. <laughs> well, for sure. I mean, you could drive down Gardner going crazy on bro, the, when this song if you, if you've never, All three of them are, are good Gardner music. Oh, man. 100%, bro. Like imagine... Um, all the time, like when I'm driving back from my parents' house, and I'm like, I like I turn, there's a certain turn on the on the Gardner where you see the skyline of the, of the city. Like if you've never played Drake, when you're like going and you're seeing the skyline of the city, like you've never feel like the most like Toronto feeling ever. It's like like for me, it's Madonna. So I play Madonna. I remember Madonna, right? By Drake. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And, and then I and then it's like at night, and then I see the whole skyline, bro. It just hits different, bro. It, it, it's just crazy. So, I just wanted to add oh. that in there, bro. But let's get to the business tip of the week, nah. man. Congrats, Drake. Congrats, bro. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, that was a fire album. All right, I don't want EP. Let's get into the business tip of the week. So, mine's really simple today. You know, um, we were talking to a potential guest um, on the podcast, and uh, there's something that came up that I was very evident that a lot of people do, including myself. Look at it putting on the Zennies. <laughs> Put on the Zennies, bro. I got to get ready for the Hustle Nation, bro. The Zenny. <laughs> you feel me? Um, yeah, so, you know, when it comes to uh, us selling our products online and, you know, um, how we're pitch- pitching ourselves, I wanted to highlight this one fact that I thought it was interesting. You know, um, there's different, like, dimensions of thought when it comes to not just niching yourself down but showcasing your benefits for instance if you have an apple right and you're selling in the grocery store um x apple could be you know this is a apple then to go further down to the benefits of it, it's like hey this is a green granny smith apple and to go further down into it, it could be, hey this is a green granny smith apple good for increasing your vitamin c levels right mm-hmm. and what i was thinking is that might not even necessarily be niching, it's just showcasing the actual benefits of your product or service because of the competition around. And that's because um, when people are looking for different, you know, service providers, products, they need to be need to have a strong description, you know. Mm-hmm. And I just wanted to share that with you guys when it comes to creating your, your products, your copy, 
um, how are you really diving down deeper, you know? Even for me personally, like li literally last night um, on my website, I have a tab that says creative services because we do photo uh, videography for, and photography for the agency with media. And someone was asking, hey, what does creative services mean? And I was like, what do you mean like we do photography, videography, you know? And I was like, damn, like, I, I should have said, you know, we do specifically, you know, um, high res photography and videography for Facebook ads and content going online. And that that detail alone, it's the exact same thing, but it's just being more specific with the benefits mm -hmm. um, that can make a strong difference um, with how you sell online. So I just wanted to highlight that because that's something I've been experiencing um, and you know, could, could make a small change to make a big difference in the business. So that wraps up my business tip of the week, keeping it simple, but something you can really take action on. What is your Apple? You know, I'm curious to see what you guys have. Um, but let us know what you think about that. Uh, make sure you, if you're not already, hit us up on uh, IG at 247Hustler. And let us know what you think. Yes, yes, bro. Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, even when we we're doing like our discovery call yesterday, we were talking about like niching and like what is like your core offering and making that well known. Mm -hmm. Like when someone sees it, like boom, it hits you right there. So it's very important to like strip the fat of your offerings and really just mm -hmm. be very succinct with what it is so you can actually attract the people who are actually looking for that offering and you're not really mixing yourself up and you can actually have a very lean business that does one thing great and can build a reputation off that. So 100%, bro. And guys, you already know what time it is. It's Mr. Hustle Muscle on the mic ready to give you the Hustle Nation tip of the week. So background, Hustle Nation is a segment of the show where I share words of wisdom from my personal experience and shared information from other entrepreneurs that aims to fuel you. It's to encourage you and keep you in a positive frame of mind as you begin this week. The hustle nation of this week is sleep. Yes, sleep. Within entrepreneurship, we romanticize this notion of working hard all night on ideas because that's what entrepreneurs do. The idea is you stay up all night, burning the midnight oil because these are when breakthrough ideas happen. I remember when I was in my early teens and I was coming into being an entrepreneur, every article I was reading and learning portrayed every entrepreneur as people who are just constantly on the go. You know, they average a minimum of four hours of sleep at night. And I fell into this culture, you know, just working hard, burning the midnight oil. I thought like, you know what, like breakthrough ideas come like when I'm 2 a.m., 3 a.m. And, you know, you can just imagine that entrepreneur sitting on their desk, like just like grinding it out. And there's one particular incident I can recall when a lack of sleep severely cost me and the business. And this is back in 2017 when I was building Sneaker Deck. My co-founder and I were traveling to Ottawa for a sneaker trade show. At the time, we were looking for a breakthrough idea within the sneaker uh, sneaker deck uh, business because companies like StockX and Goat were surging their way into the market and we needed something that was going to set us apart. We were thinking so hard of what our next move would be. What feature can we put on and what can we do to expedite our growth? So the event, is the next morning so this is on a friday so we leave class um around 7 p.m and our greyhound was at 10 p.m to travel to ottawa to be there for the event at 9 a.m in the morning especially us as vendors we got to be there at 9 a.m in the morning to set up so we're in the bus we're chatting and chatting and you know like we're really frustrated because we need to do something that's gonna like stop these guys at the sneaker trade show asking us what is different from you guys in StockX? What's different from you guys in GOAT? So we're talking, it's now like probably like 3 a.m. or whatever. And I'm like, yo, bro, I gotta sleep, right? But my co-founder at the time, he was just like, bro, you know, he said this, he's like, bro, real entrepreneurs stay up all night to get break, <laughs> groundbreaking ideas. So I gave in and I didn't want to force this breakthrough as uh, we're going through this convention. So. We didn't end up falling asleep until 4 a.m. that uh, that morning. And by the time we we're shutting our eyes to sleep, you know, the bus had already arrived in Ottawa. So we go to my aunt's house to get some rest before we go to the convention center to set up. And by the time we go to sleep on my aunt's house, we overslept and we missed our setup time. So I say that to say this as entrepreneurs, sleep is your best friend. 
ignore the bull crap of all these articles telling you just to grind it out all night and live on no sleep. Um, I'm going to attach a Harvard study that shows a correlation with your cognitive abilities and how a lack of sleep really derails you from making decisions that are sound for your business compared to when you get a full average eight hours of sleep. And I've learned that building a business is a marathon and not a sprint. Building a business is a process and a journey. And don't let anyone make you feel like you have to rush everything. You know, remember, there's always tomorrow, right? There's always tomorrow. You don't need to you need to have a fresh mind to think creatively and ideas come to you when you're alert and focused and you're well rested. So use the hours that you are awake wisely to get the work done and have a very good, healthy sleep schedule, because this is what's going to help you with your stamina. It's going to help you avoid burnout. It's going to help you think creatively because if you want to create a, if you want creative ideas, you need the right amount of rest. And that is the Hustle Nation tip of the week, guys. Let's get it and let's continue building. Uh, that's a fact. That's a fact. Sleep is so important, man. Sometimes we think that, you know, just to get this one action item done, I'm going to stay up till four o'clock in the morning. Then the four o'clock in the morning becomes four o'clock in the morning three times in a row. Mm-hmm. By the time you know, I think you know, you like habitual, so bro. Exactly. Yeah. It ain't good. It ain't good. So yeah, yo, let's get into the podcast with Jabril. One thing they want to note as well, make sure you hop on Clubhouse with us on Monday evening at 9 p.m. We're about to have an after party, the after po- podcast. Can I speak today? The after podcast conversation. Where we're actually talking to Jabril about the podcast, about what he's doing in his life right now. So make sure you come on and ask any question that you want to ask from listening to the podcast. Mm-hmm. Excited to talk to y'all, man. So let's jump in. Let's go. Let's get it, guys. Hey, what's up, guys? To support the show for free, here are some main options. If you're on Apple, make sure you rate and write a review of our podcast. This makes a huge difference and helps support the show. If you're on Spotify, follow us. If you're on Google Play, hit subscribe and auto-download so you'll be notified and have a fresh pod ready to go when we drop. Lastly, make sure you share the podcast on Instagram or whichever social platform you use and tag us. On Twitter, we're at 247Hustlers. On Instagram, we're at 247Hustler. And on Facebook, we're Hustle Over Everything. And now, guys, you got to pay attention to this point. We just dropped a new newsletter. It's called The Underrated. It's a weekly newsletter that breaks down untold stories that highlight game-changing business strategies that shape our sports, music, and culture. It drops once a week on Mondays early in the morning to prep you for the week. So subscribe to that, and we'll see you in the pod. Jabril, welcome yeah. to the show. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm hot, waiting for my AC to start bumping. And uh, <laughs> but all is good. I hear you, man. I hear you. Did everything work out well? I know you had an like, appointment, immigration appointment before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all back now, you know, just got to make sure the paperwork and everything stay right. So, but yeah, all is good. Awesome, awesome. All right, so to jump into the podcast, you know, I have an icebreaker for you. Mm-hmm. You originally lost a race, a foot race, and that taught you to stay in your lane. What happened there? <laughs> y'all been doing y'all research. Of course, man. You know, you're the guest of honor. <laughs> uh, yeah. So when, like, growing up, I, so I, I grew up in England, and so I would do, like, track and field all the time. I'd play football for, um, you know, obviously what Americans call soccer. Mm-hmm. And then... Um, it wasn't until I was like, um, I was pretty fast, so I didn't lose a race for a long time. And I thought like, um, I thought I was like the fastest man alive. Nobody could tell me nothing. And then um, yeah, it was freshman year of high school, I, um, I was racing. And then I switched schools and I went to this new school. In tra- you know, not even like a, a meet, it was just that practice. So, um, you know, I get up like, you know, like when you've never lost, you don't even know what it feel like. And so when I'm when I'm going to run, damn, like this dude smoked me. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, there must be something wrong with my shoes. I'm looking at my shoes, like there must be something wrong. And then he did him again. And like, he was just flat out better than me. 
you know, shout out to Tyler Rice from Conan. But he was he was running like ten sevens, and I, I wasn't that kind of running. Like I was fast, but I wasn't a ten seven. You know, and I was in fresh, you know freshman year. You know, for the hundred meters, and it's something for me. If I can't compete and I can't be like competitive in what I do, like I'm not gonna show up to something knowing that I'm gonna lose. I know, you know, a lot of people are fine with that. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, hey, everyone you know runs the race and everything like that. Um, you know, everyone's a winner, <laughs> but like that's just never been my DNA. And so I was like, if I can't compete um, and have an opportunity to win, I didn't want to do it. And so that's what really shifted my whole focus from like sports and athletics to um, more so on entrepreneurship where I'm like, okay, this is something I can compete at or, you know, at a high level and something I can continue to get better at over time. Because the passion was even there before that. It was just that that was like kind of like the straw mm. that broke the, the camera's back. So one thing I know is you wanted to, you like, there was like, um, from like learning about you, you wanted to play ball. You wanted, you were, you were an athlete, you had your eyes set on the league and uh, it comes a realization. Like, and I think all of us have met that point, like where you're like, you know what, this is just not happening. I don't have the physical tools. I just, it's just like, you just know it's not happening. Uh, that moment from transitioning from that realization, did you already have a hunch of what is the next thing you're going to do? Um, it wasn't like specifically like, oh, I'm going to be like the whole life is like planned out. But I definitely do. The Internet was where I was going to spend my time. And so I knew from an early age that the Internet was the way of the future, even though a lot of people were like, oh, you know, this thing is a fad. And so, yeah, I remember this is like early 2000, mm-hmm. like, you know, 2001, 2002. And so the Internet, obviously, there's no social media, there's none of these things. But um, I used to be in rooms like uh, like forum rooms, like MIRC rooms, like for my old school people. And then I just saw this world where I was like, yo, I have access to the entire world. And then mm-hmm. that's like where, you know, I started really playing with eBay as well, where it's like, I call it like the old school Amazon back in the day. Yeah. And you, know, you had everything on there. And, verse, and the thing I realized very, very early on is that you know, if I was doing something in my local neighborhood or I see these stores, right, the only people that they can sell to are people that can physically walk by their store or if they're driving. And I was like, that's that's really limited unless you're building like a huge brand like a mm-hmm. Coca-Cola or something because then you got to have to hold this. My mind worked like that as a kid. I was like, yo, there's only so big, you know, that you can go even though like you could be, I call it like you could be like a hood superstar where it's like, <laughs> oh, you're big in your neighborhood. But I'm like, that's cool. I want to be a global leader. So I was like, you know, how could I, you know, start working towards something like that? And that's why I was like, the internet is really, you have literally the world at your fingertips. I don't think enough people realize the power if you just apply yourself with the right products or services. It's like literally the world is at. And that's why companies now, you know, grow so fast. Like you can have a billion dollar company Mm -hmm. built within 12 months now. You can literally build a billion dollar company and so before, like, you know, like I talk about something like Coca-Cola or mm-hmm. these brands, these iconic brands back in the day, what you had to, to create that much value, right? So you have to do your branding, and then you also have to get, um, you know, your products right, and then you have to get distribution, right? No, what's up, Coca? You see the dog walking around. You want to be in an interview too? No. Um, so <laughs> awesome. Okay, cool. So... Um, continuing on with eBay, you know, um, was this like, did you feel at this moment you were going to do this for the rest of your life? Or is it like, hey, I'm just going to continue scratching this itch until like it, it, it fails? Um, like, I, I knew the internet was what I was going to do for like, I mean, for the foreseeable future. I was just like, this is going to continue to evolve. Like, it was like Pandora is about to open. Like eBay was that thing that when I saw it, I was like, okay, mm-hmm. more things will come. I don't know how it's all going to play out, but nobody can tell me this is not the way of the future with all of this information, the e-commerce and everything. I was like, yo, this place is crazy and nobody's even really figured it out yet. I was like, there's a lot of opportunity, you know. 
you know, hustle over everything. So I was like, yo, I got to get it. You know, I got to get it in. <laughs> Ah, uh, see. And what was like your, what was like your mom, um, your parents? Like, you know, this is like a very like new concept at the time, like selling things on the internet. What were like the people around you telling you about, you know, what you're doing online? Did they, did they take it serious? Did they just see it as a hobby? Because I know like parents, like when you do something like that, they might not be really. They're like, oh, stop fooling around, go get a real job. Like, um, how was like the the feedback you're getting from your mom and everyone around you? Yeah. Um... My mom was, um, you know, my mom loves me a lot, and so she wanted, you know, she wanted what was best for me, and so she was just telling me, hey, you know, yeah. this, yeah, well, this internet thing you are doing, I don't, you, you need to, you need to focus on mm -hmm. it because, you know, when you're older, African mom. you're going to regret your life if you don't have, you know, college degree now. <laughs> and so I was like, and I, 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 I yeah. heard, you know, I heard it, but I was like, nah, like, this, you know, inside of me, I was like, there's so much more um, to this internet. And she basically gave me an ultimatum, like, hey, if you don't go to school, uh, you got you got to leave the crib. And so I was like, Ma, I love you, but I'm out. I got to go. Like, um, and so, because she felt so strongly about, because, you know, you got to think about it. At this, at this time, nobody is making money on the internet that like they could have as like a like a barometer or a threshold like you're talking 2003 2004 like who, who you know making mm -hmm. money on it this wasn't like these times where you got social media and now it's like there's articles it was it was so new back then and so i was like nah this is the way that you know i'm gonna rock out and so but now nah, she wasn't supportive at first um but you know it's out of love my dad was, you know, supportive from the jump. I didn't, I never lived with my dad, but he was like, man, I see the way this internet, and you know, he saw the money. He was like, yo, and then, cause he, he would also help me with my orders um, for everything. And like, dude, mm -hmm. he'd help me with my stickers. And so I used to sell weight loss supplements. And you know, as like, you know, as a teenager, you know, bagging out five figure months. So he was like, yo, he sees what the PayPal was looking like and the orders coming through. So he, he's like, yo, if this is what's working, he's like, oh, you know, things change. He's like, back in the day, printing was a thing. Now, printing press. And he's like, no, this is this is it. So he was really supportive um, in that. So that that's a lot, right? Because when you don't have someone, at least anyone in your corner, and you've got a, and you're still trying to kind of figure stuff out, you're like, am I making the right decision? And if you don't have that any type of positive reinforcement, you got to be so strong mentally to even get through that, right? Because that that was one of the biggest things. But I, like, even if no one supported me, I've been one of those people like, I don't give, uh, like I'm, I was still gonna do it regardless just because I knew um, what was gonna happen. But then obviously now my mom is like, you know, obviously like one of the biggest supporters. She's like, oh my God, you know, this woman, like, so, you know, everything's Gucci now, but um, it wasn't like that mm -hmm. in the beginning. And that's just, it's one of the things of life, you know, humans are, you know, humans got to see it, you know, before they believe it. It's like uh, not not many people can, you know, believe things that they can't see, you know, currently and then have enough proof. So, but, you know, it's just a normal thing. Absolutely. That's a fact, man. That's a fact. All right. So just to put a button on, you know, your hustling as a youth, um, you also are flipping a candy at Walgreens and like stuff, was, animals uh, and stuff like that as well? That was like my young young days my candy uh so that was when i was that was like 10 years old and stuff um that was like 11 10. so like um when i was with my mom oh, and stuff my allowance was three dollars a week and then my brothers was two so my mom you know my, my mom struggled you know coming up so she never like because in the beginning when we immigrated to the united states when we came from the uk um Cause I never lived with my mom before that either. So like in the first um, nine years of my life, um, I had some amazing foster parents. And then so, but then when I came to move with my mom, we lived with like, you know, with my, with my uncle and my aunt, you know, in Chicago. And then, so she was just trying to get on her feet, you know, get a job. And then when she eventually got a job, you know, she just wasn't making much. Maybe in the beginning, probably like, mm -hmm. I want to say maybe like 15, 16, even then when she started to make like 20,000, um, 
a year, you know, it's tough with two kids in Chicago, you know, not really getting any help. And so I was like, man, I need stuff. I need McDonald's. I need the two apple pies for a dollar. I need basketball cards. I need all of these things. You got to eat, man. Um, a week won't go and cut it. And so yeah. I was like, I, right, you know, I'm, I'm good at math. So I was like, how can I flip this? I was like, all right, cool. What, what's the supply and demand at school that they're not, you know, they're not giving at school. I was like, a lot of the kids, because one of the good things, after I left Chicago, we moved to the suburbs and my mom, you know, she just really wanted us to, you know, that said, like really stress education. So she took us out to a really nice neighborhood called Arlington Heights, Illinois. Even though we had like a one bedroom apartment, mm -hmm. this neighborhood, I was going to school with kids that were like, um, parents were like, you know, lawyers, doctors, um, you know, professionals, and like their parents making 80, 100, 200,000 a year. And so for them to send their kids with like $5 a day for lunch money, seven, $8 a day for lunch, mm -hmm. I'm just like, damn, your parents just giving you $8 like that to go to school? And I was like, uh, I need some of that. <laughs> <laughs> and so what yeah. happened, I was like, okay, they're not selling warheads at school. And so I would go to Walgreens, you know, pick them up for two bucks, and I'd flip like the $2 to like $6, you know, selling the candy and stuff at yeah. school. And that, that's how like the, the hustle and the mentality really kicked off. Because when I was in with my foster parents, I mean, we weren't rich, but I wasn't like, I wasn't wanting for anything like tremendous, like, you know. I'm going to soccer practice every day. Like, um, there's food in the fridge. Like, and it was like, oh, if I want McDonald's, like, we could get McDonald's. Like, um, but those type of things, and I had my own room, so it was a completely different environment. And I think moving into this new environment, maybe it's like hustle, or you get left behind, or you don't get anything. And I was like, nah, man, this is stuff I want. And so, um, you know, that's really like how to hustle. I respect really that, man. One thing that youngest, I heard from a past interview that I wanted to talk to you about that it, really stuck out to me is that, you know, before you started the Bajanista, I mean, with, started working with the Bajanista, you know, nice. you were hustling on eBay, then you started doing like Facebook ads and, you know, getting into that game. But there was a part where you failed and came back to Chicago, if I'm not mistaken. What happened there? Yeah, so after, you know, I had some success on eBay and then I went into like the direct sales um, network marketing space and I did well in the beginning for me. And that's like, because if you're not familiar, it's like you're, you're enrolling people into the business and like, um, so like the more successful they are. And I was like, after a while, I was like, yo, it's cool, but it's not really my exact speed. And then so after doing that for some time, and also out there though, I learned a lot about personal development and I learned a lot about marketing. I learned a lot about storytelling. Um, and I learned a lot about how to interact with people and also sales, um, you know, being inside of that industry. And, but I was like, nah, it's not for me. Let me just go back to eBay. And so what ended up happening is the algorithms were way different two years later when I wanted to jump back on eBay. So I let the whole eBay thing pretty much go. And so the things that were super profitable before were no longer profitable. And so me trying to get this stuff to work, it just was not working. And then long before I know it, it's like, you know, I got my crib, I got all these, you know, all these bills and I can't, I can't keep up because like, um, I don't have the money coming in. Like it's literally like I'm down to zip because like my businesses just weren't producing anything. And so, and then, um, when it got, it got like, I never even told him that. It got so bad at the crib that, like, cause I was just trying to just keep the lights on. Oh. Like, in the crib, like, <laughs> and I was in Arizona, I was like, the bills were so, behind, so far behind, they shut off the water in the crib. Like, that's how bad it, it got. Yeah. And um, I've never actually told that on uh, an interview. I was like, and that's when I was like, man, I'm just, it was just like this circle. And I was like, man, let me go back home. I felt so defeated. And I was like, you know, I told my mom, I'm just coming back for a little bit, you know, a little visit. I miss you, mom, I'm just coming back for the visit. And then, like, after being there for, like, two, three weeks, she was like, why are you not going back to your house? And I was like, eh, you know, I just like it here. She's like, yeah, okay. And then, you know, another two weeks, and then she was like, oh, see? Uh, Something's up. I told up. you, that internet thing was a fad. 
And um, I was like, yeah. <laughs> and that's like one of the toughest things to deal with when, because I say, when you ain't got no money, you ain't got no voice, you can't even say nothing. It's like, you just got to eat it and then, you know, overcome it. So that's what happened. So then I'm back in Chicago and then I'm trying to figure stuff out of like, how can I get back? And I knew, if not that the internet wasn't working, I didn't know how to operate the internet and make it work, right? So like, I had that understanding. It wouldn't be like some people like, oh man, the internet thing, man, it's trash, it's a scam, it don't work. Me, I knew, because I've had it working before, I just needed to improve my skills, right? I needed to become the better sailor and navigate the waters. That's what I had to do. I had to increase my skill set. And so, like I said, I always took responsibility. I was like, nah, man, this ain't nobody's fault but my own. I'm sitting right here because of the decisions I made. I wasn't, you know, I had all my eggs in one basket. I was not skillful enough. And so, during that time, that's when um, I became, I started to learn a lot more about marketing and become a master marketer. Because I started to look at the common equations. I was like, if I can learn how to advertise, tell stories, um, I'm gonna be able to basically, you know, have fish for the rest of my life, you know, learn, you know, teach a man to fish, he ain't never gonna have to ask for fish again. And that's mm -hmm. what I learned. I was like, man, no matter yes. what business is out there in the world, they all want more, pro you know, they all want more sales. And if you can effectively help someone make more sales, you know, you're gonna win every time. And then the better that you come at it, the more demand, right? And if you can do it at a really efficient rate, it's like, you don't have to even sell yourself. People are gonna come looking for you, and right? And so your reputation is everything. And so over time, and I was, you know, I got into more like affiliate marketing, um, and I learned how to use Google AdWords and Google, Ad, um, and then Yahoo Overture at a really effective rate. And that's when my world really started to change. And I was like, okay, this pay-per-click thing is a big thing. It's like, it ain't going. And I, once I saw like, and then so when I started to see Facebook as well, I was like, okay, I was doing YouTube. I jumped on YouTube ads when they weren't even in the Google dashboard for my old school people. I was running ads on, um, yeah, on like YouTube PPC, where like when, like when the YouTube ads just kicked off, and it, it banged so hard, and the the conversions were so low, the cost per clicks were like stupid low. For it was the search too, because they had the search. It was like. Right now, what you so this was what that was like 2003, not even two, that was like 2010. The what would cost you could put a keyword like Tim Ferriss. So if I was like looking for people who wanted to work or be in that kind of mindset, those if they're searching on YouTube, it was like two cents a click for a link click back then. Now the same joint like probably like a dollar thirty dollar four like you know a hundred times more. So I made so much money or just being at the right place at the right time. So a lot of things are timing as well, like when you get into things. And so, but that's how the, you know, things started to turn around in Chicago. And I also got my first job when I was back home. Just, it was like, I need to get out the house because I see my mom and she used to give me that look. And so I got a, <laughs> I got a job at a place yeah. called um, AIU Online University. Um, enrolling people into an online university. I've never been to university, so like, how ironic. But I, I took a job enrolling people into, uh, <laughs> Uh, online school and then the biggest thing I took away from there too was because I asked questions when I'm in places I was like damn but I was like I see the lead generator I was like they just see leads I was like how much y'all paying for these leads and then like, like, I, like I don't know mm -hmm. and that's why I just kept asking until I got an answer and it's paying somewhere like 30 it's like 30 dollars for each lead and I was like oh huh. and then, you know they're not buying anything they're not doing it's like literally just the lead and so I was like I see if you get the right things matched up and they got thousands right they got a whole call center and so they slamming through these $30 leads day in day out and I said man okay I, and I even got a chance to talk to the CEO of the company that was a whole nother story of like because like everything I try and make the most of the opportunity because they, they sent out a company newsletter um, so his name's Gary E. McCullough shout out to Gary and he so when I looked him up I was like oh snap it's actually like a, a black CEO. And so um, and so for companies that were doing over a billion dollars in revenue a year, there's only 10 um, CEOs in America um, that were, you know, black CEOs. And I was like, I just, you know, I was just emailing, emailing his assistant, because obviously most people, because they're like, 
they probably just said like, oh, that's her and I can never get like the CEO of the whole company. And I was like, you know, that's literally the lowest part of the company, the very lowest. You know, I ended up, you know, having breakfast with him, mm-hmm. and then I can't. I told him like my boss, and she was like, "How'd you go out with?" And I was like, "Start using my mind." She's like, <laughs> and then. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's so much opportunity, but people just have to see it. You know, we have a good understanding of what your company does, but for our audience, uh, can you give us like a Literature. breakdown of like how uh, Live Richer Academy uh, functions? Yeah. Live Richer. Yeah, no problem. So to kind of give you, so one of the companies I have right now is um, a company called Live Richer Academy. And I have that with my amazing business partner, Tiffany, the budgetista, <laughs> budgetista. And, um, mm-hmm. and shout out, she has a new book coming out, Get Good With Money, um, just an amazing book. And so how this came about was, it was about 2014, so I've known Tiffany since 2010 or so, 2011, and then we'd see each other online, and I was like, yo, it's coming about, like, and I was like, I really wanna do something different, and I saw a huge gap in the marketplace and this was financial education. And so there was some blog, there was some YouTube videos, but nobody was building the business with ads. Like nobody, and especially um, for like black women, like uh, women of color, there was like nothing that really spoke to them. And so I'm a big person, when I see a gap in the marketplace, I said, there's major opportunity here. And so what I did is we started to build that business. And so before that, Tiffany had never done anything um, as far as like online ads or made any money online, everything. She had a, a book, a self-published book at the time. And then also she would go out and she just had like her first like six-figure year. So she was like make like $5,000 maybe speaking at like this event or she would make 3000 But she had to keep traveling, um, you know, to make this money. Mm-hmm. And so when I was talking to her, I was like, hey, what is it that you want to accomplish? What are your big goals? And she's like, you know what, bro? Uh, I'm in a really good relationship right now, but I don't want to have to travel unless I want to travel. And I want to be able to, you know, do this. And I was like, you know, what do you do as far as affiliate marketing? She's like, what's that? Um, you know, so you just never even heard of like affiliate marketing. And, um, and I was like, yo, we could create like a membership site, you know, an awful lot of value. And she's like, okay. So, and then I told her like, yo, how well we could do. She's like, okay. Like, now you're just talking shit, man. Like, how, how are we gonna do something like that? <laughs> and um, yeah, we got busy. So we literally have, a, so with the Live Richer Academy, is that, as I told you to give a little backstory to kind of how it came apart, um, came about, is we have a, a platform where we teach women about budgeting, saving, investing, mm-hmm. anything personal finance inside of, um, inside of a membership site. And um, we have different teachers, we have live things, and then so, and then how it works financially, like for us as far as a business, is um, we charge thirty dollars a month for our for our membership, and so the women are just like super happy. They get like way more value, um, you know, than we actually charge. And uh, yeah, we have about forty thousand members that pay um, currently thirty dollars a month. My goal within three years is to hit um, a million members. Uh, and so yeah, that's where we're um, currently at right now. And, it's just, and for me, one of the things that was so important is that I wanted to create something about legacy. And so mm-hmm. with the business, um, it's kind of like why I'm so passionate about travel and a lot of things that I do is with the Live Richer Academy, I know 30, 40, 50, 60 years, this is still gonna have impact, right? So they're gonna be someone who's in the academy now, they have kids or their grandkids, and like, you know, how did we get this house? You know, well, back in the day in 2022, I was learning about credit and how to budget in the Live Richer Academy, and that's why we have this. <laughs> or, mom, how'd you learn how to invest? Or why are you teaching? Well, you know, back in 2019, I was taking this class in the Live Richer Academy, and that's, and so, that's the way my mind thinks of like, not just make money, but how can you have a legacy with the work that you do, right? So mm-hmm. it's beyond the money because of the work that we do, we live forever. Or like with my travel um, brand, Passport Heavy, 
a lot of people see places and go places that maybe they didn't feel comfortable about, places they didn't know. And they're going to be like, maybe they, their kids are taking a family trip, you know, in the future. And they're like, yo, dad, how'd you learn about this? Mom, yo, I was on YouTube, saw this dude. And then I, you know, ended up going to this place or going to this, you know, doing that. And so everything I think about doing, I'm always thinking about, is there any legacy involved with like, because it's always beyond the money. And so that's like a big thing that um, mm-hmm. that I like to like incorporate when I'm doing any type of work as well. Or it's the ad game, like for like this is how I learn yeah. ads, you know, etc. So. There's there's this one quote uh, as you're speaking, Jabril, just came to me, is uh, legacy is greater than currency. And I think I heard um, Gary Vaynerchuk quote that, uh, coined that term, and it just stuck with me as well. Like I think as entrepreneurs, we're so focused on building the wealth, building the money that we really forget that we need to have a purpose because I think there's like a point of like diminishing returns where you have a certain amount of money where the more money you get, the same feeling doesn't come the same way you yeah. got it the first time. So um, that's that's impact. When did you realize that, you know, once you once you crossed that threshold, what was that um, thing that came to you and that made you realize, you know what, there, there needs to be more to what we're doing? Um, did you go into it with that purpose of, you know, we need to help women uh, budget? At what point did you realize it's just bigger than making money for you? Um, definitely before the Live Rich Your Academy. Um, and that's why I wanted to, where well, I was like, you know, it really aligns with my purpose. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if there's a specific moment, but it, it just came to, you know, it came to a point where I was like, all right, this stuff is cool. Start something, stop something, or affiliate marketing. It's more about money than it is about like purpose. And I was like, oh, cool, you make some good money. But it's like, I was like, it, it wasn't like, it wasn't soulful for me. And so I was like, when something's soulful, I can do it day in, day out, year in, year out. And you, like for me, and I love marketing too. I love storytelling and marketing. I guess, like I've been doing marketing now for almost 20 years. It's not something that's like, oh, damn, I got to go do this shit. It's Monday. Like. I get up and I'm excited, or the travel video. I love doing it. So I don't know if there's a specific time. I can't go, it's like, oh man, I was taking this walk down the <laughs> beach and it just hit me. That's when, like, I think it was like uh, something that, you know, just come over time of, and then just seeing when people are grateful for you and the work that you do, it's like a, it's like a drug where, you know, I read comments, I get DMs, people send me a video, yo, I've been to this place, or hey, I've just bought this home now. Hey, or it's like my mentor, you know, my mentees, or like my home guy, Nate, from New Zealand, like I'm so happy he just bought a house in New Zealand. I won't even say how much the crib was. Like, he was a plumber in New Zealand before, right? And it's, it's so beautiful to see when you pour into people, and then they become more than maybe even they saw possible. It's, uh, it's just like an addictive feeling to, um, you know, to see people grow. Yeah, most definitely, man. Mm-hmm. Seeing the actual impact you're making is way more valuable than seeing the actual currency because you feel like you're, you know, talking to your why as a human, right? Versus just, mm-hmm. you know, making stacking money in the bank. Because after a while, it's like, all right, what can I do with this? You know, all right, I'm traveling, but like, I can't, what am I going to do? Buy more clothes? Like, what's clothes really going to give me in that sense, you know? Yeah. Yeah, like eat at the, all the restaurants, you know, do go, you know, go all these have amazing experiences, and every every entrepreneur says the same thing. It's like I had a, like one um, mentor of mine. He's just like, yeah, man, we sold our company. I made like fifteen mil out of it, and I did everything. I mean, I traveled, I bought the apartment, I bought the car, I I ate at the best rest. Like he did everything, but then at the same time, it's like I wanted to get back in the grind because I feel like creating that value is what drives me every single day towards like, you know, fulfilling my purpose. So completely yeah. agree with you. you know, on that, one thing man. on uh, getting to like my marketing brain, you know, um, you've grown the Richard Ac- literature Academy yeah. to like, I think with 800,000 women that were participating in the, in the literature challenge, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So they have over a million women in our, like our free challenges and within the community and in our paid community, we have about 40,000 in our paid community. So, so all right. So, this from a marketing standpoint, could you break down like how you went about it? Was it just Facebook ads, for, like a click funnels? Like, what was like the the strategy, just so we can get some understanding? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. 
So there's a, there's a few different things that, um, that we did. So when doing the original challenges, so we have like a 21, a 21 day challenge, we have a, and there's like one that's a 36 day challenge. So we have these three challenges. One might be about credit, another's about budget, another one could be about um, home buying, another could be about wealth. And so we create videos or it's an image ad of you know, Facebook or Instagram ads and it's, and it's like, it has a little bit, um, I like storytelling so I feel, and I feel the reason why I'm one of the best Facebook marketers in the world is because it's not so much of the technical stuff all the time because it's understanding the audience on the other side and it's the ability to write stories and connect with the audience so as you know the copy you know goes out so then after they see something that they relate to so it might be a story about Tiffany where hey I was, you know, whatever, bad at budgeting, and this is my story, blah, blah, blah. And then after that, it's like, hey, and then I, I felt so passionate about it, I've wanted to share it with someone else. So I put together this free 21-day challenge. And so from there, they go opt into the, into the challenge. So this is what I slam, you know, a lot of ads to. Um, and that was like crazy, um, putting people into all those, you know, different challenges. And the crazy thing is, for a lot of those challenges, like you know, as you were talking about ClickFunnels, we use ClickFunnels now, but we also use lead pages. Um, and then, like, we were getting opt in rates, it's crazy, is like at 90% opt in rates, right? Like double opt in and infusion soft. Um, and so that was a big part. And then, how we've, um, and that was for the free challenges, and then how we've enrolled people into the, um, Academy, the majority of the way, has been through webinars. So it would be something similar, storytelling through a, a Facebook, Instagram ad, or it could be even a YouTube ad. And then from there, we um, put them on a free webinar, like an hour-long webinar. And at the end, we offer um, you know, the Academy. And that's always been is a, a simple rinse and repeat process. And uh, that's, you know, that's literally what's made us um, a lot of money. Um, a lot of impact, and uh, that's it. It hasn't been super, super complicated. It's just a lot of different ads and the storytelling. Like, you have to become a masterful storyteller. Everyone's looking for the shortcut of, like, oh, what little thing do I need to do within Facebook? But the magic is understanding your audience and getting amazing copy, and, like, how do you help people, you know, through the process? That's the magic. Not so, yeah, you do need to know some of the technical stuff, but um, that's not like with it, because you gotta remember it when people are scrolling through on their phone, how are you connecting, you know, with the people? Like, you gotta like, yo, who is this person on the other side? What are their interests? What's gonna get them triggered? Like, what, you gotta go inside of their mind versus just like, oh, pretty picture. That's like, what, what are they feeling, you know, mentally? And that's what I feel I do better than, um, you know, most people in the world. All right, so we, we dropped off at the Bajanista. But I feel like it's probably time for you to move on to add value and passport yeah. heavy. I mean, we talked about ads. You know, let's, let's jump into passport heavy. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think I think that's about I think that's about right. All right, let's do it. So, for passport heavy, from what I hear, you invested over 300k into producing passport heavy without getting a dime back. Is this true or false? Um. That's false. It's been, it was more than that. But, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Now, um, it's been, but yeah, next one, but yeah, it's true. It's true. Um, it's true. All right. So talk, talk to us about this journey and this decision, you know, and, and um, how you came to, to bring this into fruition. Um, man, I, I started with doing, <laughs> just regular videos with like a little, I've been making videos since, I was actually just looking on YouTube. My oldest videos on YouTube are like 15 years old, like 15 years old on YouTube. I was like, wow, this is crazy. And you're a vet. And so I've been practicing storytelling for a long, long time. And when I started to travel around the world, I was having a different experience than I thought I was going to have, and then also a different, um, I had a different perception after leaving than most people have of different places around the world. And I said, I want to tell these stories. I don't feel that they're being told. And then also, 
I wanted to tell, um, I tell stories for everyone, but I do have obviously an affinity to black people. I feel we have a different um, experience around the world. So I said, I want to tell stories that make people feel comfortable because it's like one, you hear one story, then people could get put off a whole place, not even knowing that 99% of people have a completely different experience. But it's like, obviously, negativity drives, um, you know, news and stories far more than positivity. And so I said, I just want to share my reality of these places that I'm going. And so that's how um, they started. And they were just with basic little, um, like $200 camera. You know, I can't really edit. I can't shoot. Um, I have vision, but I just couldn't. And so for years I did that, but I was getting hundreds of thousands of views on, so like my channels before um, Passport Heavy. And then after, um, I said, I, I want to bring on a, um, like actually like a real filmmaker, like a full-time filmmaker um, on the squad. And so I did that. And then people obviously saw the production comp uh, production value jump like overnight. And people were like, yo, this is crazy. Like uh, we ain't never really seen nothing like this on YouTube. Yeah. And so I'm, I really am one of the OGs when it comes to traveling, um, you know, in the space. And so I know it's had a lot of impact. And this thing is like, and it's like, it's grown so much that like people that don't even know who I am, the people that they are now watching were inspired by like, you know, some of the videos that I was creating. I kind of feel it's like with, uh, like in the marketing world, a lot of people might not know, the youngins might not even know like a Dan Kennedy, right? And um, that's who like someone like Frank Kern learned from. And, and then so some of these younger boys learn from Frank Kern and it's gone on, you know, like that. And I feel like, I, I do feel like one of the OGs in the travel game, um, it was just, you know, the stuff that we're doing, but that's how it came about. And then I just love telling stories. I love having people go to Columbia. They have a perception and they're like, yo, I thought it was just before, like when I was going in like 2011, they're like, yo, Columbia. Now it's like Medellin has become kind of a thing, and people, more, you know, more people are familiar with it. But when I was going, it was nothing. Or like when I went to Thailand for the first time, I saw four black people in Chiang Mai, Thailand, in like a uh, like black Westerner, probably like four months. I saw four, and that was in 2011. And this is like when you know, locals would be coming up, rubbing my arm just because they didn't see, you know, no black people. And then I went back in 2014 and I saw the impact just within three years. And I said, wow, I'd see like four people a day. And three out of the four would come up to me and say, yo, no lie. Like, I've been watching the videos and it really impacted me to like come out, you know, to come visit like Thailand and stuff. And it's like, and I don't really document like a lot of stuff. And it's like, but if there was like a real documentation on like even the money that I've brought to Thailand or like help bring, even like that's one thing that is documented. Even like my suit tailor um, has made over $800,000 off of the mentions in my video, has made over $800,000 USD. Wow. And um, he's like, yeah, people come from all over the world to shop. They say they see it in the video. Um, and then, because I, I like just to know, I'm like, who? And he's like, everyone, people from Russia, people from China, you know, some black people from America, white people, and then all different. Um, because the thing about the videos on YouTube, which I think is different than my Instagram, not, not that even I think I know, is that when you were searching, especially like when you go to think, it doesn't matter what color you are. They're like, they're just watching because it, it pops at the top of the search engine. So like now I do feel like more black people will jump off and come follow on Instagram. But like just the people that are watching, um, it's everyone from, you know, every race is influencing everyone. And one of the craziest things is like, obviously I can see the analytics. The number one thing um, shared um, platform for the, for the videos is what's up um is what's up so like people are like taking the videos and then sharing them like in their group chat and they're like yo this is gonna be the oh, WhatsApp. Yeah. yeah yeah and um and that was crazy to me i was like oh snap that's the number one way people share our videos is um 
It's through WhatsApp. Get out of here. WhatsApp, yeah. People probably plotting moves to travel and they're like, hey guys, like check out this video. These are some things we could do, yeah. you know? Uh, that's how we plan. Even like me and my family, like we're like all in the group chat sending photos, like hotel rooms and everything. So it kind of like, I think by doing that, it kind of uh, ignites people's imaginations of, you know, what they could do once they get nah, there. Definitely. That's a fact. And that, yeah. you, you, that's how I kind of discovered you. I discovered you through um, being black in Thailand video from like wow, years ago. Wow, that's like way ago. back. <laughs> yeah, that's OG videos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For, yeah. for, for me it was the one you did in london the one like things to do in london and that whole storytelling of the journey coming from like i think you were in a it was, it's not a bentley but i think you're in some luxury car and then you went to some posh uh club yeah. in london and just the, sh the the way you guys shoot your videos you guys take like a ordinary i won't say ordinary but the angles the way you cut the way you tell the Shout story to start to finish that's um yeah, my filmmaker, it was it was I amazing. Man. I got to give Ann a big shout out. So he's the one who shot that. And then, so he actually he has a course out called the online film school. So that's Ant creative on Instagram. And because so many people are like, how do you do those cuts? How do you do this? Um, he put together a whole, you know, film school. And so and it's dope it is really, really well put together because people are like, yo, how do and so he did that. So shout out to Ant. Because people definitely know this. Mm -hmm. uh, Jabril, I have a question for you, or more it's like a statement. I really want to just uh, get your thoughts on this. I feel like uh, over the past, I'd say five years, there's a renaissance of the, the black travel, mm -hmm. right? Um, you're seeing like a lot more black travelers, a lot more uh, individuals who are documenting black couples traveling. And um, back when it's in high school, coming into university, I didn't really see these type mm -hmm. of aspirational posts of black people traveling yeah. and having fun and being joyful. Um, you are one of those people who were the pioneers in documenting that. I mean, you're a black man, uh, you know, like you're just like a regular guy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what are your thoughts on this? And we're seeing a lot of these brands, digital media brands who document black travel. Uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on that and what you think ignited this whole uh, space. I think, man, this so... I love it. Like I, I love to see it. Mm -hmm. I love to see us like being celebrated, happy, joyful. Because it, it, it adds to the um, to our story, right? And how we're represented in the world. Because there's always been just kind of like one stereotype of black people, and then so when people travel around the world, they expect you know black people just to be one certain type of way. And just like in every race. There's all different types of people. And so I love that more people are sharing their stories. Um, and I think it will continue to grow because I tell people everyone's voice is so powerful. So you don't have to have, you know, 10,000, 50,000, a million followers to have impact, right? So here's the thing that happens when you share your experience. So it's like, now that you have maybe 300 followers on your Facebook, Instagram, whatever, TikTok, whatever, whatever, whatever y'all watching this, whatever is relevant to you, right? <laughs> um, now you probably are gonna have two people that you influence in your in your circle to want to go to that place because they've seen you talking about that experience, and it becomes so much more relatable because you they know you, right? So now they're like, oh snap. Maybe I could actually go do that. Man, what's the call? That's Johnny from Mother Black. I see Johnny. Now nah, he's been to Thailand. It doesn't seem so mystical because this YouTuber with 3 million followers on it. So I tell people, your voice is so important. So I love when, and they're sharing people that are not, um, these people are, you know, they're lawyers, they're doctors, they're, they're engineers, they're school teachers. They, they represent all black. And so I love that people are able to see nurses and just mm -hmm. like i love it because it just it humanizes it especially for like our culture um i i love it i can't wait to see more of it um and it's like i just want to be a part of like really helping people and just to and let people know their voice really matters because i tell you because like you might even have a lot of views and then you, you're like whoa but if i say something who's really it's like yo those 20 likes really 
matter. And you, that's another thing I tell people. You never know who's watching. You never know who's watching you and, you know, and what you're doing and the impact that you're having on people. Because I tell you, it'll blow your mind, you know, and you can just help people. Like, you know, be authentic. But I, I was going to say love for like the 40th one. I love seeing our people out there, um, you know, seeing the world in that and, um, and all the groups. Shout out to all of them. Like, I, I love it. I absolutely mm-hmm. love it. Awesome, man. Um, what is the vision that you see Passport Heavy developing into? You know, you're already on Noir TV, if I'm not mistaken, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, um, where do you see it developing into the future? I I see it developing into definitely like just one of the biggest travel, um, you know, documentary series that inspires people to see different places. Um, I definitely see more of a community aspect. One of the biggest things that I know from traveling over time is having a community aspect for like my passport heavy, you know, viewers or people mm-hmm. to have when they go to different places. Or so if it's, you know, it's probably going to be like an app, right. Probably coming soon. Um, and so <laughs> of where people can get together. And so you might be in Phuket, you might be in Bangkok, you might be in Bali, you might be in Thailand and you're like, ah, oh, I don't know if I really want to hang out with, it's nothing like I used to be a backpacker, right? Like, I don't want to hang out with backpackers. I don't want to hang out with these types of people. I want to hang out with my own swag, you know, and like people that are maybe more entrepreneurial or they're like a certain type of in corporate, mm-hmm. but you know, they're grown and sexy doing their thing. And you're like, I don't really have, know how to connect with them while I'm here in this place, especially because now you know, working remote is really a thing now, right? It's, and it's getting bigger. And the job world of working remote is way bigger than the entrepreneurial space. And so they're looking for these, one of the things that stops people from going places or staying places longer is community, right? Because they're like, oh, I don't really feel comfortable. I don't have my people. And that's what stops people from even, oh, my friend's not going, so I'm not going, right? Or I don't want to stay as long because I don't feel. And so I've been thinking and I'm like, okay, let me do something that could bring people together and they know if they're watching like the passport heavy videos or if they're in that kind of community, they know the kind of swag, the mindset that they're coming with if they're, um, you know, going, you know, and connecting through the passport heavy community. So that's like some of the vision, some of the, the, the big vision I see for passport heavy is having more of a community aspect that brings people together overseas. And then, you know, and then also within the app have some, so it's like, you know, you want to do the same trip as me. Hey, let me let me hook you up with all my people um, and like talk to them and be like, hey, you want a 10% discount or whatever. I won't make anything off it, but just like to get, you know, the people of like, like oh, yo, those are my people, you know, take care of them. Or if it's a suit, hey, I know y'all made enough money already. Like give my people a discount when they come through or something. So I just I having um, an app that connects the community within the Passport Heavy community. And then... Um, I keep it 100, man. It's like, I definitely see the, um, like the Netflix play or the, you know, like an Amazon Prime play or something in the, in the near future where we have, basically it's going to be, so if I go do Nigeria, right? I do the Nigeria episode, maybe it's like six episodes. And so I do it like, shout out to my cousin, Malik Bey, Bey Pandis, yeah. Bay Pundits. Um, and so probably do that, like do it with like Malik and Wiz or something, right? So like, hey, see Nigeria through, you know, Passport Heavy, Malik and Wiz, or I go to, you know, just different cities or it's like go back to Chicago and uh, shout out, I have a dope episode of Chicago coming out with Kelly Edwards. So she's got her show on the Travel Channel, got so much, you know, she got the Ford commercial Explore. She got so much. So we did a Chicago episode or it's like, you know, going back to Chicago, probably even doing someone like, I don't know, like Derrick Rose or something like shout out to Pooh. So it's like, or just in these different cities or going like iconic leaders, like a six episode series with, um, with some iconic, you know, gotcha. dope people that I've had mm-hmm. relationships with. Yeah. But like, that, like Mr. Fab. 
Yeah, so that's something I can see that, you know, could pop off, um, which is, I feel is like not too far off into the, into the future, so. I, I agree. I think that's a play a lot of people sleep on, you know. Um, I was hinting at that as the answer for like the 300K. Um, and I think that's a play like a lot of us are creating content now. I don't see the future plays of, hey, this could end up on Netflix, this could end up on Amazon, this could end up on even a, a website that houses their own content individually that's not on a streaming platform. There's a big business in leasing content, you mm-hmm. know, um, that not, not a lot of people think about when it comes to, you know, creating their own content. They just think of, hey, let me create a landing page and an ebook mm-hmm. and get it out, out the door, which works too. Don't get me wrong. You know, but there's also a bigger play that has a bigger bag to it that's going to pay way more than whichever amount was that initial yeah. investment. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So, yeah, it's definitely like something like our audience needs to think about. It's like, yo, what's the long, long term goal for it? You know? Yeah, there's um the CEO of Morning Brew. He, uh, he had like this tweet, right? He was saying that content is a new currency, mm-hmm. right? I, I think every organization, whatever you're in D2C, you're in health sciences, whatever it is that you're doing is content is the king right now. I, I know we've heard it like from guys like Gary Vaynerchuk and everything, but every business, it's just not on the individual level, like where you have to create content is like as a business, you need to have a podcast, you need to have videos because everything that we do on the phone is all content based, right? For example, like a health company, you might be tweeting something, but it might be a meme that shows like the doctor or a physician doing something that puts your brand in, on the map, right? So creating that content strategy is so key and everything. Um, you're one of the people who like, you know, you, of course you create videos and, and content and everything. Um, but for e-commerce brands and everything and the people who are building these companies right now starting out, what are some content strategy tips that you can give them for one of the things Alex and I spoke about was user generated uh-huh. content, right? Uh, we'd love to get your takes on this and how to really get users and your audience to really react because early on you're talking about doing heavy, heavy research into them. So how, what, what are your thoughts on user generated content? How do you cultivate that content to get your audience to really make it their own per se? Yeah. Um, obviously depending on your, your product or your service, you want to have things that obviously that are working if it's, if it's the before and afters, right? If you're celebrating them, you know, in that type of way, or just if your stuff looks good, I think the the packaging I think is really underrated. Um, if your packaging is amazing, I think it's kind of like a restaurant, right? Like I tell people. If you're gonna open a restaurant these days, don't make no boring shit. Make it Instagrammable, right? Make your restaurant Instagrammable because then you're gonna get the free publication, right? The free publicity from them excitedly. Oh my God, look at the spot that I'm at! Woo! Or if the presentation of the food is, oh my God, look at the food! And it's the same thing if you have an in e-commerce. Mm-hmm. If you have something creative, mm-hmm. It, it comes in the mail versus just like, oh, it's just something. They're like, oh, snap. Like, boom, I got my whatever. Like, these are the different things. It might cost you a little extra, but that kind of marketing and you create that brand that separates you. And then that's how you get people. Because it's, it's, it's simple, but it's not. It's like make something that people want to share and you don't even have to beg them. They're going to want to share what you have if you're doing something creative, um, is it come, you know, when it comes to your users, like really think about how, how you can deliver, <laughs> literally deliver, um, you know, your packages differently. That's a big gem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as we work towards wrapping up, you know, is there anything that you didn't cover that we didn't cover that you'd like to talk about? Um, maybe add value that you want to get, get into real quick. Um, yeah, so I have, I mean, ad value is, um, you know, people want to learn about Facebook and Instagram ads. Um, so I have a course um, on that. But more, like, I mean, I'm pretty chill. Just come, if you're on Instagram, I mean, I'm always on um, I'm on Instagram. It's like probably like one of the top places I hang out. So Jabril8 or follow Passport Heavy on Instagram. And then the YouTube, um, that's where we drop uh, a lot of our videos. 
Um, and then from on the Instagram, I think you'll see the Noir TV and just everything that we kind of have, um, you know, going on. That was, that's what I would say. Yeah, just check us out on there. And then um, it's been fun, man. I appreciate y'all. Where y'all at in the world? I don't know where y'all at. Oh, we in Toronto, man. T dot. Oh, she up with T dot. Um, six, 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 six. <laughs> Nice, That's nice. a fact, you know what I'm saying? If you ever come to Toronto, you got to come check us. You know, we know a few good restaurants. So trust yeah. me, we, we can hook you up for sure. Yeah, man, we'll, we'll take you out, man. Wine and dine you, bro. Pause. <laughs> Pause. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, um, you can find us on Instagram at, at 247Hustler. I'm Alex. And I'm Owen. And I'm Jabril. I need one of those shirts, man. Let's go. So that's the address. We got you. Yo, we'll swing you one, man. Yeah. And with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, the hustle is what you can't control. So control your grind and control your life. Peace. Peace oh. out. Thank you so much for listening. The conversation continues on our Instagram at 247Hustler. We post very frequently. And be sure to check out our merch at hustleovereverything.co. We have some amazing sweaters, hats, mugs, and a lot more. Lastly, our Proud to Pay program is linked in the description below. Thank you so much for your support. Talk to you next Monday. Peace.